come from a family with money. I was born into a family where my dad was an alcoholic. My mom had to raise me, and it was a massive struggle for her. Now, I know that's not the norm for everybody, but it was my norm. And I had to do what everybody else was unwilling to do, just like all of you. You're the 5%. You did what the other 95% were unwilling to do. You showed up today. So because of that, and my journey to becoming what I am today, I didn't ever have a plan. I was a dreamer as a kid. We didn't have money to have the things, so when I wanted something, I had to actually go out there, and I had to just dream it up. I had to draw it on paper. Me and Jordan, my filmer back here, say hi to Jordan, everybody. Jordan, Jordan travels around with me and does the video stuff. So me and Jordan were talking about this, and we were talking about visualization and manifestation. I'm not here to talk to you about that, but that's how I grew up. And because of that, as a child, one of the biggest goals I had when I was a young man is I wanted to be a pro snowboarder. Now, none of you have ever been to Buffalo, but let me give you some stats on Buffalo. There are no mountains, there is a hell of a lot of snow, and it's a shitty place to live for all intents and purposes. But when you want to become a pro snowboarder, the lack of a mountain is a problem. So when I told people I want to be a pro snowboarder, they told me I was crazy. They said, kid, you can't do this. My dad said, you know, stop living the pipe dream, come get a job at the factory. But that wasn't my path. And whoever ever tells you that you can't do what you want to do, by the time I'm done with this story, you're going to think you can go out and do anything you want because you can. So one of the things I did is I did become a pro snowboarder. You can see, I mean, one photo up there. That was at the end of my career. But let me just describe something. How many of you have ever faced fear in real estate? You get a deal and you're like, oh, I'm scared, right? We can be, we can be real with ourselves. In snowboarding, we faced fear all the time. But I'll, I'll talk to you about one of the events that I went to. It was my very first pro snowboarding contest. It was in New Hampshire. I got there super early. I remember I drove all night. We got there. And before the lifts were open, I'm standing there waiting. I'm like, yeah, here we go. This is my big chance. And it was fog. And I, the lift's open. And I'm going up the lift. And as soon as I get out of the fog, I remember looking over to my left. The fog was breaking. And right there was this thing. They call it a jump. But it was the biggest jump I'd ever seen. Now, if you haven't ever snowboarded, there's little jumps, decent sized jumps. And there's hell no jumps. This was a hell no jump. And I looked at it, and instantly, my excitement gave way to the most profound fear. I literally thought to myself, I'm just going to go up to the top, and I'm just going to wrap it around and ride this thing back down and just say, whoops, I forgot my sunglasses, and get down to the bottom. But when I got up top, I realized this is my moment. So I'm walking around up top, got my headphones on. I'm just listening. Riders show up. We're all thinking the same darn thing. We're like, hey. But see, as snowboarders, we have to play this game. This Rochambeau game, because there's always got to be a guinea pig. Somebody's got to hit this thing first. Somebody's got to see, can we actually clear this thing? And if we can't, well, I don't want it to be me. So I lost the Rochambeau game this trip. And what that meant is I get to be the guinea pig. Anyone ever had a guinea pig? Mm -hmm. Please tell me it wasn't to feed your snake. OK. <laughs> All right, so I'm standing up there like this, and I'm looking down at this jump, and I'm just breathing heavily, thinking, oh my god, if I go too fast, I'm going to overshoot the landing, and I'm going to drop from 30 feet flat down. Now, I can't do that. That'll blow my knees out. I could break my back. OK. But if I check my speed too many times and I go too slow, I'm not going to have enough speed, and I'm going to hit the knuckle, and I'm probably going to blow my knees out. And you're thinking of all these things, right? When you have these real estate deals you're doing, things come into your mind. Oh my god, if it doesn't work. Oh my god, if I can't get the money. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Fear engulfs you. Well, I was engulfed in fear at this moment. The starter comes up to me, and you see him out of the corner of your eye. He says, Chris, are you ready? I, I want to say, hell no, man. I'm not ready. Look at me. And he says, go at will. And you know what that means? That means it's time to leap. So I'm sitting there thinking. And I leap. And then there's a moment of silence. And then you're off in the air. It's better when I got a mic on. But when you're in the air, Every bit of that fear is gone. Do you know why? Because then instinct kicks in. The practice kicks in. All the times you practiced, studied, and looked at how you do this kicks in. And then all of a sudden, you ride away. Now at that very moment, all you can think about is, can I get back to the top of this hill to do this trick and that trick and this trick? Folks, I bring this story up, not because I care if any of you are snowboarders, but because it's the same thing as business. In business, we have to leap. In business, we have to face fear every day. In real estate, are you kidding me? We have to face a lot of fear. You got to leap, folks. 
the best opportunities on the, are on the other side of, oh, my God, which is the same as fear. So I went on to be a pro snowboarder. I also opened a chain of skateboard snowboard stores called Fat Man Board Shops with a PH. And that was great. My life was perfect until one day driving home or driving to my new store in Orchard Park. And I remember driving and on the radio I hear of these planes hitting the towers. That moment, I didn't know what to make of that. This is the first thing that I, that is the first recession I'd ever gone through. I didn't know anything about a recession. I was 23 years old. But when those planes hit the towers, that was a change in my life because my retail stores were highly leveraged. And all of a sudden, they dropped 30% in that recession. I say this because right now, whether you believe it or not, and you can follow me on any social platform to see kind of what I talk about, but I, I can't call myself an economist, but I will tell you something. What I lived back then, what brought me to my knees there and again in 2008, is about to happen again. But here's the good news. Call it a recession, call it the next Great Depression, because this will be a doozy. For everyone in this room, you know what this is? Can anyone tell me what this next recession is for you? That, you're damn right. I'm not used to getting everybody saying the same thing. It is the biggest. <laughs> wow, I almost feel like I need to have a beer. Uh, it is single-handedly the biggest opportunity of your life, if and only if you're ready for it. I wasn't ready for it. And because of that, I had to get a job. I went to Little Caesars and I applied for a delivery driver, but they were not hiring. I didn't know during a recession, not, people don't eat as many pizzas. They didn't need new delivery drivers. Put my resume out there and the only idiots that got a hold of me were Wall Street firms. Go figure. I'm a punk snowboard kid and here I am getting calls from Wall Street people that want, want me to put suits on every day. I went to my first interview and I remember that guy. Anyone see Boiler, Boiler Room, that movie? All right, there's a scene in the movie where the, the guy sits down with a firm and the guy slides the keys of his, I don't know, it was a Ferrari or a Porsche across the table. This dude played that perfectly. And then he says to me, if you work at this firm, you will have one of these cars. I said, where do I sign? Because, <laughs> hey, that sounded pretty good in the position I was in. So at 23 years old, I answered Wall Street. And it was an interesting period of time, but when I got there, I realized something. I watched all the big advisors around in the big glass offices around the outside, and I watched what they did. I was a pretty astute kid. And I remember thinking, all right, they get here at 8.30, 9 o'clock. They leave for a two-hour lunch, and then at the end of the day, they're gone by 4.30 or 5 o'clock. I'm like, so if I want one of those offices in half the time, I just got to do everything they're unwilling to do. I showed up at 7, I worked through lunch, and I saw people in the evening at their kitchen tables. And because of that, I became one of the top three advisors at that firm. I was crushing it, making a lot of money. This is from 2003 to 2008. I was one of the top advisors, crushing it. And then all of a sudden, I saw a TV show where someone flipped the house in 27 minutes. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, I can do that. So off I went. 2006, my first flip. 2007, my next flip. 2008, before the Great Recession, I decided my, my lease was coming due at the end of that year with my retail stores. And I said, you know what? Why would I pay him more rent when I can just buy this dilapidated building, convert it into a three-unit strip mall, and have everybody pay for my rent? It sounded like a great idea. But folks, there is a right time and a wrong time to do things. You would think as an advisor I would have saw the Great Recession coming, but I didn't. And it brought me to my knees. How many of you in here have ever gone one direction thinking this is it, and then all of a sudden something happens and you're going the complete opposite way? But see, the Great Recession brought me straight to my knees. And I'll never forget that night. I had nothing left. One payment, and I was bankrupt. I could pay the hard money lenders one more payment, and it was all over. And I came home. My girlfriend, who had just moved into my house right there in the center, okay? At that time, she was my girlfriend. We've been married 14 years now. But she moved in, and... I come home to her one night, I'm gonna use you, Joy, and I said, sweetie, I need your help. I need your help paying the mortgage. What's your name? Jamie. Jamie, Jamie, I need your help paying the utilities. And by the way, sweetie, my friend Pete's gonna move into that bedroom downstairs, as if I was about to say, any questions? <laughs> but I mean, I seriously had nowhere else to go. I was against the wall. My friends told me you had a 10% shot of her sticking around, but I think she kinda liked me because we've been married 14 years and we have a two-year-old daughter now. So things worked out and that's how I made it through the Great Recession. I don't ever want to be in that position again. 
The next phase of my life, I bought apartment buildings. I was still an advisor for, from 2009 to 2014. Warren Buffett was my hero, still is today. But what does Warren Buffett say is the secret to making money with investing? Can anyone tell me? It's three things. Okay, but there's two things before. That, how do you not lose money? You do two things before. Buy low, sell high. Buy, that's it. Buy low, sell high, and don't lose money like this fine man right here just said. So that's what I did. I bought apartment buildings, pennies on the dollar. I mean, can you, how many of you wish you could get in that DeLorean, take it back to 2009, and do what you do today, right? I was doing it. And I got up to 36 units by 2014. I was doing what I thought I knew was the right thing to do. I brought my 37th door to that same bank that took me out of that loan with those hard, hard money lenders and that same bank that had funded all 36 units I had, and they said no. They said, Mr. Noggle, his name was Greg, they said, you don't fit in a little square box. Some of you already know what, I made, what mistake I made. Your debt to income ratio is out of whack and we can't give you the loan. And by the way, Mr. Noggle, those two lines of credit, we have to freeze those. I'm like, what? I kind of need those to finish the apartments. Uh, come on. See, I was borrowing in my personal name. Do you know why? Oh, because it was cheaper, right? Commercial loan, personal loan, what's, che what's cheaper? Personal loan, someone said? That's what we think. The commercial loan's always the cheapest way to go. But I didn't know that, and I did that. And because of that, those 36 units had to all be sold because I went in a vir uh, just a vicious cycle straight down. And every unit, I had to sell them all. And I went into one of the most difficult periods of time in my life. So you see this roller coaster, right? I had it, then I lost it. Then I had it again, and I lost it again. And I remember right after that, I was at the lowest point in my life. Larissa had left. We had to sell our dream house, 171 Radcliffe. And in the mail comes a postcard. How many of you have ever received a postcard that says, come to this seminar and learn how to flip houses? Anyone? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, dude, don't you ever learn? <laughs> but if I flipped it over, it said, if you come to this seminar, we will give you a free iPad, or I'm sorry, iPod shuffle. So I had nothing to lose, and now I got an iPod shuffle to gain. Off I went. I'm not a dumb guy here. I used logic at that point, so I went. And I remember listening to all these guys. I'm sitting in the very back. And then finally, two guys get on stage, Mike and Greg. And they talked about money. Now, I'd already told you I've been an advisor at a very high level up to this point. So I perk up. But what they were saying about money was so foreign to everything that I'd ever known about money. It was literally the complete opposite of everything I'd been taught to do. And at that moment, I dove down the rabbit hole. I rushed to the back, dropped 2,900 bucks to go to this other seminar. You know how those things work. And then and it's an 80 grand after that. And yeah, you guys get the drift. But I did that. But Greg today is one of my business partners. We operate five private funds, debt funds that we lend on real estate. And he's become a dear friend. Mike, up to that point, was lending me money. And I remember one day in Cheesecake Factory, him sitting there telling me he was going to lend me money on a deal. And I just said to him, I said, Mike, how do you lend money? And he says to me, he says, well, I lend money from my bank. And I'm like, Mike, you got your own bank? I'm like, why are we at Cheesecake Factory? Let's go get some dumb, dumb suckers at your bank. <laughs> so what he told me next was what I'm going to teach you. Now, Mike had a show on a &E. If I told you his last name, you'd all probably know him. Maybe some of the younger folks wouldn't, but I, I think you would. He's a very, very wealthy man. And he did what you're going to learn tonight. But see here, this is an important thing. I want you to really focus on this. This is Will Rogers. Will Rogers says the problem in America is not what people don't know. The biggest problem in America is what people think they know that just ain't so. See, I was an advisor, so I thought I knew what I didn't know. And that is where everything in my life changed. To date, we've had a show on HGTV. You can look it up, Risky Builders. So it's, I, I had it right down at the bottom. Uh, we flipped 272 houses. I have sold almost all of my rental portfolio, and that's because I am the bank now. I lend money because Greg, that one guy I told you about, said something to me when he was on stage, not at that event, but another one. He said, the ultimate in real estate is being the bank. And I thought about that, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? All these flips does seem like the lender's always making all the money. Doesn't it sometimes seem like the lender's making all the damn money, but we're out there doing all the work? True or true? So this was my hang up. I thought I knew what I didn't know. So let's dive in. I want to give some books away. Is that okay? First off, we're going to test the knowledge here, and I'm going to give books away, and I'm going to teach you how to do this tonight, but how to get all the money back for every car. So first off, who can tell me first what is the definition of money? Just blurt it out. 
Definition of money. Who? Means. Wow. Have you watched my video? I'm part of the campfire, bro. <laughs> yes. I didn't see your name. <laughs> part of the campfire. I know what that means. Means of exchange. Money is nothing more than means of exchange. Money for food, food for money, money for house, house for money, money for car, car for money. Don't make any mistake. That's all money is. And if you make it anything more than that, that is incorrect. Secondarily, what company in the world uses compound interest? Banks. Okay, obviously that's not the right answer. Government? All of them? No banks? Nope. Nope. They've already been around the campfire. I don't think you have this book yet? You can have this one. There's not a company in the world that uses compound interest. Banks don't use compound interest. Banks pay us compound interest. They charge us compound interest. They don't use compound interest. And I'll give you an example. So let's just say, can you be my banker today? This is my banker, okay? We need to get the Facebook Live going. Yeah. So I go into the bank and I give my banker $2. Does she take my money and put it in a little box with my name on it in the back in that vault? No. What does the bank do with my money? Simple. Loans it out. Sends my money that I worked for to work for them. And in doing that, do they make a spread on that money? They pay me how much today? Let's just be nice and say one. Point We're going to say one, and they lend it out. What's a loan going for today after the Fed's done their dirty deeds? Six. So what's the spread? Five. That's how banks make money. OK, we'll get that in a second. I'm going to use that in a second. Banks don't use compound interest. Grocery stores don't use compound interest. Car dealerships don't use compound interest. Money's constantly in motion. Money never sits still. The only ones that have been taught to leave our money sitting still is us. That's it. Because we have been taught to do that to benefit them. Now, I don't mean to poo-poo on banks, but you know what? Banks make a lot of money on our hard work, and it's time for us to change that. And you can. OK, are your dollars worth more now or in the future? No. Of course now. I got some books up here, so as you guys want, I'm just going to put them up here. You can come grab them, OK? Because <laughs> you already know that. And the next one you're all going to get right to, taxes, up or down? Up, okay, so here you go. Come on up and get some more books. <laughs> if someone wants to hand them out, that would be great, because you guys already got those. So retirement plans. What do you know about your retirement plan? Anyone here got a 401k, 403b, 457 plan? Some of you do, right? Yeah, we got a 401k. I almost should do like an auction thing. 44, if I'm not mistaken, $44 trillion sits in qualified retirement plans. And most people that are in a 401k can't tell me what they're in, why they're in it, or what it does outside of, well, this is what I put money into to retire someday. You see, we have been taught to do things with money we would never do with things that money buys. Because if we just go through everything we just said, number one, when you put money in a 401k, are you in control of that money or is the institution in control? Institution, right? That's why you can't take it out without a penalty or taxes, and that's why there's all sorts of rules. Secondarily, when you put that money away, it's put away for 5, 10, 15 years. So if we wait 15 years, how many years are you going to retire in? Hopefully in about a year. Damn, you're a bad example. <laughs> Anyone else got a 401k in here? <laughs> but anyway, so well, you do. So how many years before you retire? Uh, never, but probably <laughs> Don't say that. 35. 35 years. So you're going to put your money in that 401k for 35 years. You're going to give up control of it. When you take that money out, will it be worth more or less? Well, no, no, I know you're hoping with growth, but will your dollars be worth more or less at that time? Less, right? And when you take that money out, please answer this one, right? Will you be in a higher tax rate than you are today? 100%. Bingo, 100%. So we're putting our money away. We're giving up control. We're going to take out weaker dollars later because we already said inflation is going to get a hold of them. And not only are we going to take back weaker dollars, we're going to pay more in taxes. How is that a winning proposition? Look up Ted Bennett and read his book, 501K. The man invented the 401K, and he hates 401Ks. I'm not the one up here just poo-pooing on 401Ks. The guy that invented them tells you they suck. I'm not saying they suck. If, you, if you're putting money in a 401K, keep putting in it up to the match. Anything beyond that, let's go grab a beer and discuss why. Okay. All I will bring these questions up is just to test your level of knowledge, to so see how you think about money, because tonight I'm going to challenge everything that you think about with money. And let's do that first with talking about cars. Who in here bought a car this year? Anyone? What would you buy? I bought an old Ford van, a 2005 Town & Country All right. So how much was that vehicle? Can we just say 25 grand for tonight? <laughs> All right, what's your name, Darren? All right, so Darren bought a $25,000 conversion van. Did I get that right? 
Yeah. Okay, outside of the price. So how did you buy that vehicle? Cash? Okay, how many different ways are there to buy cars? There's four ways, right? So we can buy cars cash. What else? Finance. Finance, lease. Steal. You can always steal the car. That is actually the fourth way, but don't steal the car. If you get caught, it's not a good story. So there's four ways to buy a car. So let's just say he's going to buy this vehicle. Now, to buy a vehicle cash, he's got to have 25 grand in a bank. So when you bought your car, you had to have that money in the bank, right? And let's just say you found yourself a really, really good bank that pays you 4%. That's a good one, isn't it? So if you found a really good bank, I'm just going to play as banker. Banker Noggle. It's got kind of a ring. I don't love it, but I'm going to go with it. So I'm going to play as banker. So he comes into the bank and he says, Chris, Chris, I found this awesome conversion ban. It's 25 grand. I'm going to take that 25 out of the bank that I'm earning 4% on, and I'm going to buy this vehicle because I don't want payments. And I say to Darren, I say, whoa, whoa, Darren, hang on a second. I'm your banker. I'm going to make you a deal. How about our bank makes you a loan for 6%? For the next 60 months, we'll give you 25 grand, and your 25 grand never needs to leave the bank, and then you're just going to make monthly payments to us. Is it? Am I making a good suggestion? We're going to charge him six, and he's making four. Darren, but then what if I told you, I promise you our bank will pay you more in interest than you will ever pay us in loan interest on that car loan for any period of time you want? Am I lying to him? Yeah. Right, because six minus four is what? Negative two. Banker isn't such a good banker anymore. Well, let's just run the numbers, because now, now we get into mathematics, thing I love. His monthly payment would be 483.32 on that car. Okay? Future value, if he paid all 60 payments to the bank, he'd pay $28,999. Does anyone want to take a guess how much money he would have in his bank if it had 25 grand earning 4% over the same exact time frame? 30,000. 525. You can check my math. But unless we do math differently in Buffalo, that is a $1,526 bonus he just got for leaving his money there. Can anyone tell me why? Compound interest. Yes, sir. His money never left his account. It's going up at a rate of 4%. His loan he took out is 6 but it's being paid down. One is going up, one is going down. Simple versus compound interest. I only show you this just to really show you that we need to understand how money works. But the problem with this equation is that bank, when he had that 25 grand in there earning 4%, he couldn't use that 25 grand. But if you paid cash for the car, that 25 grand would be gone anyway, so it's kind of the same. But what if you found yourself a really good bank that paid you 4%, but then you found yourself a really good bank that told you what I just told you, but then they said, hey, Darren, anytime you want to use that $25,000, you come in here and we'll give you 25,000 bucks wouldn't that be pretty frickin' sweet? I know, it's too much to take in. It's a lot, I get it. That would be a really good bank. So how many of you are business owners in here? Okay, you all love your business. You work hard on it, right? So if you owned your own restaurant, would you bring your clients and your friends and your family to your restaurant? You'd be proud of that, right? You'd bring them there to eat, okay? For the women in here, if you had your own salon, would you get your hair done at your salon, or would you go to the competitor down the street? Go to your salon, wouldn't you? Yeah, okay. How about if you owned your own gym? Anyone in here own a gym? Every once in a while, I'd get lucky. If you did, would you ever work out at the, you do? Yeah. That's freaking badass. Do you, work out at your, do you work out at your competitor's gym? Where do you work out? At your gym, of course, why? That's right, because it's hers. Everybody sees where we're going here, right? If you owned your own bank, would you make deposits into your bank? Okay. If you owned your own bank and you wanted a car loan, would you take a loan from your bank or somebody else's bank? Your bank. And if you took a loan from your bank, would you pay your bank back the same amount you pay Bank of America or Wells Fargo? You wouldn't. Okay. What would you pay? A little less? That makes sense. Okay. So if he was in control of his bank because he owned a bank, he could control that. But you would still pay your bank back, right? You would never steal from your bank. What happens when we steal from our business? We go out of business. So that's what I'm tasked right now to show you how to do it, which is be your own bank. And I'm going to show you something that the same people for, for hundreds of years have done, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the JP Morgans, okay, the Stanleys. Then we got up here on the screen, Walt Disney. Okay, how did he start Disneyland? During the Great Depression. Yeah, you're going to learn. How about Ray Kroc in the middle? When Ray Kroc decided we're going to be a real estate company, how did he fund that? Well, I'm going to show you. Doris Christopher, pampered chef, sold it to Warren Buffett. How did she start that? I'm going to show you. 
All three of these and all those other families I just said were their own bank. And the question I never understand is how come everybody doesn't know about what I'm about to show you? But before I get into that, let's just go over some boring stuff of how a bank works. I think we all understand this, but let's just go through it. If you took 100 grand, you deposited into a bank, and they pay you 4%. We already agreed that's a good bank. Is that an asset or a liability to you? Asset. What is it to the bank? Liability. So we've all read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> all right, so if it's a liability for the bank, the bank does what Robert told us, turns it into an asset by lending it out. So they lend it to somebody to buy their home. Now when they buy their home, that homeowner gets the money, and the seller does what? Exactly what they've been taught to do, puts it back in the bank. And then the bank then moves that money, loans it out on a car at 8%. Dealership gets the money, does what they've been told to do, puts it back in the bank. Your husband or your wife decides they want a new man cave or a new kitchen, so you take a home remodel loan. You pay the contractors. Any contractors in here? Got one? Well, you're an honest contractor. Some of them don't put the money back in the bank. That's the reason I ask. But most do. Okay? And then you go to Las Vegas because you celebrate that new flip you just did, and you made a lot of money, but you put it all on red and it hits black. It's okay. What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. So you don't tell the spouse. You go to the bank. You get a debt consolidation loan, and you pay the bank back. Who is in control of every one of those transactions? The bank. Okay? How much risk did the bank take to do all those? Very little risk, right? They took a little but they were collateralized in everything except for that debt consolidation loan. And now, let's just do some math. If you owned a bank, just like this bank, you would pay an interest rate for people to deposit money, but you would charge more, making a spread the whole time. So the spread is three on the first one, okay? Four on the next one. I gotta fix that, it's out of order. And then I'm just gonna put them all up on here. Come on. There we go. So the bank made 20% more than you did. Where's my wallet? Now. You're excluded because you already know the answer, and I'm going to actually make this real. So I'm going to give 20 bucks, okay? Real $20 is not fake. I promise I didn't counterfeit this one. $20 for the person in this room that has not already seen my video or my presentation that can tell me how much did the bank actually make in this transaction. The mathematics are on the screen right now. You just start blurting it out. Percentages, please. Keep going. Not infinite. Mass right on the screen. I got 20 bucks on the line. The mass percentage. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Three. Two. One. Zero. You all just missed 20 bucks. Okay. Four. Divided into 20 is what? Five. Five is five times more, right? Is that not 500% more than what you're making? Okay. 500% more. Go to BauerFinancial.com if you want to check this. BauerFinancial.com, look up any bank, any time frame. There isn't a bank in this country that makes less than 400% on the money we leave there, and we keep doing it. They make up to 1,300%. Folks, I just wanted to show you what a bank does every single day, because you know what? You can do the damn same thing. You just don't know how to do it. So let's just dive in. There's three components to you being your own bank. First off, we call it the money multiplier method. There's a machine. That machine is going to be used for one thing, to run our money through it. Because like I was talking earlier about that really good bank that paid us guaranteed interest, that allowed us to have our money in a tax-free environment, that allowed us to use that money anytime and still pay us interest and dividends while we use that money, that exists. And we call it the machine. All right, but the second part of that is building wealth is a marathon. Building wealth takes time. Got to have the understanding that building wealth takes time. A lot of people are in a rush to make money. It's why right now so many people are captivated and mesmerized by a thing called FOMO, fear of missing out. Every deal they come across, they jump at it because they think they're going to miss out on something. The only thing people are missing out on right now is a thing called patience because the biggest opportunity is right around the corner, not right today. And secondarily, you've got to have a destination where you're going. Okay? You've got to know what you're working toward. Maybe it's retirement. Maybe it's, I want a million dollars. Maybe you want a billion. It doesn't matter. But it all starts first. We've got to figure out this machine. So what is this machine? The machine that I'm talking about that's been used by all those wealthy families throughout history has always been the same. 
and it is nothing more than a dividend paying whole life insurance policy from a mutually owned company. Now, before I go any further, I know exactly what some of you are thinking. Matter of fact, if I really looked, someone would get up and go to the bathroom. Yeah, he's like, oh, you son of a bitch. You had me going. But here's the thing. If you think I'm talking about a regular whole life that your broke-ass brother-in-law sold you, you are mistaken. You know who the number one purchaser of whole life insurance is in the world? Can anyone tell me? Banks. Banks. Look it up. Google this. Bully. B-O-L-I. If you don't believe me, because nobody ever believes me when I'm telling you this, Google Bully. Bank-owned life insurance. And what you will find is you will find something that comes up on the FDIC.gov website that shows you just the top five banks. And right here, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, US Bank, PNC Bank has 75 billion. If I do all the banks in this country, it's over a trillion dollars. So you tell me, are banks stupid? Or do they know something you don't know? See, the way we design these whole lives is completely backwards and upside down. Now, anyone in here think a Ford Focus is a super sexy car? Got to be somebody, right? No? Yeah, ah, smart. You said it depends which one. How many of you have ever heard of Ken Block? Rallycross driver? So if you go to Google or you go to Google or YouTube and you put in Ken Block's name, you will find Ken Block going 130 miles an hour sideways in full control driving what? Ford Focus. So you're going to tell me that that Ford Focus is the same one that you all just said is not a cool car? But they are. They're both Ford Focuses. You know what the difference is? Design and engineering. That is it. So a whole life can be designed and engineered to do what you never thought possible, but give you all the benefits of, quote, unquote, the tax code and how it looks at life insurance. When we design these plans, I'm just going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because I'll bore you, but we put the lowest death benefit on. Do you know how the commission is paid on life insurance? The death benefit. So we're going to bring it all the way down to the bottom, the lowest death benefit we can, and we're going to stuff the most amount of money we can in based on what your needs and goals are. So when we do that, what that does is that reduces our compensation, our commission, by 60 to 90%. So in order to do what we do, you have to find somebody that's willing to construct a whole life that is built so that they make 60, and I would suggest getting higher to 90% less. Now go try. Call your financial advisor. Call them up. Say, hey, Bill. Yeah, yeah, I just saw this presentation about this stupid whole life thing that Dave Ramsey said is a piece of shit. And Susie Orman said the same thing, I think, too. And he's saying you could do something weird with it, but you got to take a 90% cut in your commission. Can you do that? Oh, that dude's full of shit. They can't do that. Yeah? Look me up, folks. Over 6,000 clients is what we have, and not one complaint. You're going to tell me that I'm telling you something that's not true? It's absolutely true. You know it's true absolutely works exactly the same way we say it. Not only that, if we design it that way and I give up 90% through the way I construct it, guess who gets 90% more cash value to use immediately in the first 30 days? You. In life, it is the fifth law of wealth. We have to give generously without conditions. Give and you shall get. You've all heard it. All I'm doing is following the law, folks. So I know that was boring for some of you, but let's dive in, okay? Who wants that car? Eleanor, we all know Eleanor. He's like, hell yeah, man, give me that thing. But what if I could show you how to have that car, but how to get all the money back for every single car you will ever buy, drive, and own, and it works every time. You want to see how to do it? Okay, Darren, I'm going to take his. So he paid cash for his car. So there's four ways to buy a car, but we're going to pretend you're going to pay cash for the car, okay? I know that doesn't fulfill everybody's short-term needs, but if you wanted it bad enough, you could. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to change one thing to make this work. Can everybody in here change one thing? One thing, that's all I'm asking for. Can you do it? Some of you are like, I don't know. This guy's like, I'm still not buying into this whole life thing. He will by the time we're done, trust me. Okay, one change, and that is where your money goes first. Not all your money, but just the money you're going to save or the savings for this car. So let me show you the numbers. If we just changed where $10,000 went each year, don't get hung up on the number. It's just an example. It's easy math. And we put that money in, and this is a terrible example, but I'm going to use it. Immediately, when we put that 10 grand in, we'd have about $5,800 that we could use immediately, which is about just under 60%. Okay? Three years later, you would have saved enough money to take out $25,000 to buy that vehicle. So if you owned your own bank, you already told me if you took your own bank, you would treat your money the same way you treat the bank's money. So what does that mean? You'd pay your bank back, wouldn't you? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that $500 a month payment that you would have paid Wells Fargo or anyone else, and we're going to pay it back to your bank. What is your bank, folks? A specially designed and engineered 
whole life, okay? Just so we're clear on that. So we're gonna pay that 500 bucks back. Now some of you are now thinking, wait a second, I just saved up 25 grand and now you're telling me I gotta pay back $500 a month? That was my money. Hang on a second. What if I told you that every payment you made back to your bank was available the very next day and you could use it? Would it be any different than taking 500 bucks and saving it in a savings account? Identical. All right, so let's do the math here. So all we did is we changed where the money went first, we bought a car three years later, and then we paid our bank back the $500 a month. Okay, so we put 70 grand in, we then put 30 grand back in our account, paying back for the loan that we took for the car, so that's 100 grand. We bought a car, so subtract 25 grand for the purchase of the car, our true net injection is $75,000. Anyone got different math than I did? Okay, all right. So now, when a car is five years old, what happens to it? Well, if you take it to the dealership, you need new tires, new tie rods, new brakes, front and back, the seats need to be cleaned and everything else. So what you do, you go out in the lot, and what do you do? You sit in another car, right? How many of you do that? Anyone? When you get in a new car, you sit down, you're like, this is nice, wow. And you shut the door, and then you go, oh. It's that new car smell, folks. They make air fresheners. Make no two ways about why you buy a car. So five years later, we gotta buy ourselves a new car. Okay. That first car, by the way, actually, shit. There we go, I hate Max. That first car, I didn't give you the math, we got 91 cents back of every dollar we paid for that car. We have 67,000 in our account, we put 75 in, we have 91 cents back, and we didn't have to sell the car. That's the first thing. But I told you we were gonna see how to get all the money back. All right. Second car, she so sat in it, you want it, you're not gonna make any more deposits into your account, okay? I would never tell you to do this, but let's just assume you're gonna put no more money into your account. So eight years later, you're buying the second car. The first car is still in the driveway, so you got 51,000, you took the 25, well it's actually 51 plus the 25 out, and you do the same thing you did before. You just pay your bank back the same way you'd pay their bank back. So let's do the math. 30 grand was paid back to your bank, zero deposits were put in, you took 25 out, your true net injection is 5,000 bucks. Now I went fast, so let's just, let's just look at this. We're 12 years in, we have two cars in the driveway, bought and paid for. How much money's in our cash value whole life policy? $91,473, okay? How much money do we have after the first car? 67, so we made 23,592, but that's not the real number, because if you go down and you look, we put 75 in the first seven years, 5,000 in the next period, what's 75 plus five? 80. How much money's in line 12? 91. How much money did you make for buying two cars? $11,473. And you have two bought and paid for cars in the driveway and all you did is change one thing. Now I know this, this doesn't work for everybody because not everybody buys cars for cash. But after seeing this, isn't that pretty compelling to, for you to start thinking about maybe in my next car I will do this way. Okay. So that's just cars. Now let's, let's keep going here. There's three rules to make this work, okay? First, we had to pay ourselves first. And we haven't been taught that. We've been taught to pay our debtors, our creditors, our expenses first. We always come last. We put our needs last on the list, which is why we never get where we want to be, because we got to start prioritizing us. So you got to pay yourself first. Second, pay yourself with interest. If you're paying the bank back with interest, then pay yourself back and treat your money the same way. And third, recycle and recapture the money that you're used to giving away to somebody else's bank. Is everybody clear with that? Any questions on that one? Anyone in here have debts or know somebody that has debts? Good, nobody has debt in here, great group. <laughs> it's okay, I wouldn't say it either. So let me just run through this really quick because this is gonna drive it home and then, then probably some of you wanna see how can this be used in real estate, right? I think I got some time left. So this is a real client, he was a chiropractor, okay? And he had, came to us, he had all these debts, totaling $478,000 in debts. That means if you added all those monthly payments up, he was paying $5,777 a month. So he came to us and he said, Chris, can you help us with these debts? And we said, Mr. Chiropractor, how much money are you saving right now? And he said about $25,000 a year. It was a mix between money he was putting in a 401k, in a bank account, so on. So we said, all right, well, what if we just took the 25K a year you're saving, and instead of saving it, we just pay down your debt? That was the answer. 19 years is how long you'd be paying that. You think that was acceptable to him? No freaking way. 
So then what we did is we ran some math and we said, okay, what if we can do it in six and a half years and you don't have to change anything? Save the same amount, pay the same amount, nothing in your life change, changes. And he said, show me how. So here's what we did. First thing, we changed where the 25,000 went each year. We put it into that stupid, specially designed and engineered whole life. And I will keep calling it stupid because I swear to God, if somebody can show me a better place to put their money, they will do everything that a whole life can do the way we design them. I promise you, God be my witness, I will change every presentation, I will take down every YouTube video, and I say this every time I speak, you think anyone has ever found a better place? There isn't one, which is why we keep using this vehicle. So he puts 25 grand into the whole life. Immediately in the first 30 days, he takes 14,863 out. And what do we do? We pay down Discover, we pay down Lowe's, we pay down Nordstrom. Lowest to highest, if you like Dave Ramsey, yeah, thanks Dave, we borrowed your snowball thing. But while doing that, we then were able to save $448 a month. And that is literally just the monthly payments that we no longer have to give away to those. So we got 448. So what we told this chiropractor and what we tell everybody is, well, here's what I want you to do. Go to your local bank, open up a second bank account. We're gonna call it a segregated bank account. Set up a bill pay or whatever you wanna transfer and put $448 every single month into that account. It's the same money you were giving away before, we're just moving it into a different account. Everybody follows that, right? I'm gonna go faster, is that okay? Everybody understands what we're doing. We're changing where the 25 goes, we're taking money out immediately in the first 30 days, and whatever we free up, we're just putting into a bank account. He didn't lose any liquidity, everybody understands that, right? Okay, here we go, year two. 25,000 goes in, he takes 16 out. So now we're compounding, and I'll get into this in a second. The money he saved in that segregated bank account was 5,374, so he's got 21 grand. We're gonna pay off Nordstrom, Wells Fargo, and the private loan, plus we're gonna knock down the BMW payment. So in doing that, we freed up a little extra money. And that little extra money now brings it to $1,917. He was, this is just money he was giving away. It's now being saved. Next, the next year, we're on to year three. Puts 25 in now, this is important. Three years in, for the first two years, the amount of money he put in, did he have more or less to take out each one of those years? Less, that sucks, doesn't it? Okay, third year, for the rest of his life, every penny he puts into this account, he will be able to take more out. It doesn't matter if the market tanks, it doesn't matter if we're in the Great Depression, the money he puts in, because of compound interest, simple mathematics, he will take out more than what he put in. That's very important. This is what we call uninterrupted compound interest. This is the reason the wealthy use this. 23 grand he takes out, or I'm sorry, he added in the segregated account, so he's got 48 grand, which is the loan plus the segregated account. So what do we do? Pay down BMW, pay down West Marine, pay down the condo. Folks, we're four years into this thing. He's now got a monthly payment to other people of 2,100, and he's keeping 36.77 in that segregated account. How's he doing right now? Pretty darn good. Let's just do a marathon. Remember I talked about that marathon. The first three years sucked for this guy. He put 25 grand in each year. The first year he was only able to take 14. And folks, just for the record, when we do these presentations, you could be my witness to that, we show the worst plan designs ever. Your plan will not look this shitty, I promise you. But we love showing this because when I show you the worst thing and you see what it actually looks like and it's better, you're way happier. Okay, so 16,025. Put in 75, took out 55. How much money is left? You said 75? Well, he's absolutely right. A lot of people say 20 because they still haven't seen that the money never left their account. That's right. So he put 75 in, he took 55 out. Most people think there's only 20 left, but there's not. There's 75 left in his account. Do you know why? Life insurance promises you, to, whole life specifically, promises you two things. A guaranteed interest rate. Right now, between 2 and 3.75%, depending on the company we use. We use Mass Mutual, One America, Lafayette Life, Penn Mutual, and Guardian. Just, I'm an open book. Okay, the thing when we take the loan from the life insurance, are we taking our money? Nope. The life insurance company also promised someday when we graduate, and just so you all know, I know we're all invincible in here, we're all gonna die someday. Sorry. But when we do, the life insurance company promised to pay a death benefit, but they never told us in the contract that you can't use the death benefit while you're living. So all we're doing is when we're taking these loans, the insurance company is giving us part of our death benefit in the form of a loan, which they do charge us interest on, okay? And then our money never left the account. So this is how you earn uninterrupted compound interest. But some of you are still questioning, yeah, but it was a loan. They're giving it to you as a loan. 
the loan never needs to be paid back until you die. Now, that's not what we teach, but do you all understand that? If they're giving you part of your death benefit, if you never pay it back, what happens? They just subtract the amount of the outstanding loans from your death benefit when you die. Secondarily, you're probably thinking, yeah, but they charge interest on those loans. Indeed, they do. I've never met or seen an insurance company that operates as a nonprofit. Not yet. Okay? So when they do that, let me just give you the math. I'll use Mass Mutual's numbers. They pay you 6% dividend and interest, and they charge you 4. What is your spread? Two. Next year, what is your spread if it was two the first year? The answer is more. The next year, more. The next year, more, because your money never left your account, so it's always compounding. You're always working off of a higher balance. Any questions on that? It's a very important piece, and I wanted to get it out of the way. So let's go into year four. So now you can see compound interest. You put 25 in. The chiropractor took 26304 out, which was a loan against the death benefit, okay? collateralized by the cash value. They were saving 36.77 every month, so that's 44 grand. They have 70,000. Now this is pretty crappy, but when you pay down your house mortgage, does your monthly payment change? Sucks, doesn't it? Banks and bastards. So we do that. We pay the condo down, and nothing changes in the fourth year. It's a very defeating year. Chiropractor goes on to the fifth year, puts 25 in, takes 27 out, then takes the 44,127 in the segregated account, pays the condo off, pays the house down. We're five years in. The chiropractor now has a monthly payment of $1,221, his mortgage payment. He's saving $4,556 that he used to give away. Good day in the office for the chiropractor. If he stopped here, is that okay? But you never, ever stop before the game's done. I've never watched a football game where they're like in the final thing, they're about to kick the final field goal. Hold on. We're good, right? Doesn't happen. You finish the game. So the sixth year, something weird happens. Anyone that knows life insurance will understand what's called the MEC rule. So he bounced against the MEC rule, which is an IRS rule that says you can only put so much money into a contract based on the death benefit. So instead of being able to put 25 in, he can only put 10 in. But because he got used to doing this and he wanted to keep doing it, he said, well, I want to put the full amount in. So he started branch office number two. How many banks in this town are there? Is there only one branch office? Bank of America, how many of them we got? One on that corner, this corner, that corner, that corner. Your banking system should work just like theirs. So he's got his second branch office, which is another policy. And he's going to take a loan from each of them, 13000 from the one. So he put ten in, and he took 13000 out. What's the cash on cash return for all you real estate folks? Put 10 in to a real estate deal. In the first year, you make 13,000. What was your return on your 10 grand? 30%. Does that make any sense? Because it should. It's compound interest, folks. Albert Einstein explained it well. He said it was the eighth wonder of the world, the most powerful thing in the universe. Those that understand it, earn it. Those that don't, pay it. That's just math, folks. He put 10 in, and he can take 13,000 out. How many of you want a bank that you can put 10 grand in and take 13 out, all of you. And the next year it will be more, and the year after will be more, and the year after will be more, because mathematics don't lie, okay? The second policy he does, he takes 14, but long story short, he has enough money, 82,000, pays off the house. Now, all that money's gone. Now, if I were to show you all the money that he saved on those houses by not giving the interest to the banks, it'd blow your mind. It's over 700,000, but I wanted to save your time. Here's how it worked for me, Key Bank. There's a bank in Buffalo that might have them out here. I owed KeyBank $23,000 on a line of credit, and they did charge me 9% on that line. It was an unsecured line of credit that I used for real estate. So when I got into this, this is one of the first policies I did. It was early on. I have nine of them now. But I put twenty-five dollars in. Now these are real numbers, folks. Okay? I put $25,000 in my policy, and I immediately took out $23,000. That's better than 60%, right? Real estate investors are like, man, I'm not giving up 60% of my money. Mm -mm. Or I'm not giving up 40% of my money. I, I need more. So would that be okay if you put 25 in and you were able to use 23? Okay. So I did that. I took 23,000 out. I'm making six because this is mass mutual. Making six, paying four. I was paying KeyBank nine. So what I did is I paid off KeyBank. $289 a month that I was giving KeyBank. And what did I do? I put it back in my bank. Same dollars. Nothing changed just went back into my bank. I want you to all in your minds right now, I want you to envision what we're doing here because it's quite simple. I want you to picture a circle, okay? Everybody's got the circle in their head. We're changing one thing and that is where your money goes first. So on the right or the left side of the circle, this is your new bank. This is where your savings goes. Our goal is not to put the money in the whole life and leave it there. 
don't call me if that's what you want to do. Because if any of you are happy with 6% as real estate investors, we have to have a different talk. Okay? The goal is to put the money in and immediately find a place to get that money to work for you at a higher rate. In this example, it was 9 So I take a loan out of my policy. Now I'm making 9%. Then we're an honest banker. We take the amount we paid KeyBank and we put that money back into our bank. The whole time, what did, what did you make that whole time that was going on? Spread. Remember, we talked about the spread. I made a spread on my money. Secondarily, I took back the 9%. But some of you don't have debt in here. Some of you are real estate investors that have done well and you have money. Well, I hit that point too. It was really fun. I had money and I'm like, okay, all right, now what do I do? I got to find some folks that need some money. So I used to go around to Ria's finding, hey, who wants to borrow money? And people would literally grab a piece of paper and say, here's an address. Do you want to give me 200 grand? Anyone done that before? I'm like, um, I might need a little more. So I started this process of teaching people how to be good lenders and good borrowers. In this process, I was successful and I found good borrowers. I literally just educated them and I made for good borrowers. Then I started teaching lenders how to do this. So, and then I learned there's two types of people in the world. There's people that have money and there's people that need money. The people that have money have a problem and that is they want to make more money. Is that right? Okay, some of you are like, yep, I got money and I want to make more. The people that need money, just the rest of you in here, okay? You need money to make more money, right? You got that deal, it's under contract, you got 30 days, I need to close this. Who can give me my money? That's why you're here, right? Am I not correct? Like you come to RIA's because some people in here have money, some people need money. I identified that. And then what I did is, ladies don't be mad at me, but when I was a pro snowboarder, I was always single, very smart. And when I was single and I'd travel around, I'd always want a companion to hang out with when I was at the other place, Utah, Colorado. I used dating sites. Some of you in here have used them too. They have this thing called Tinder now, swipe left, swipe right. God, I wish I had that back then. <laughs> back then we had Match.com and eHarmony. So what I started doing is I started basically going on, looking at profiles, where I was gonna be, and it was easy. We chatted, and then sometimes it worked out, okay? As I had money, I started to think to myself, I'm like, you know what? Why isn't there a dating site for money? Why isn't there just one community, just like eHarmony, or better today, Tinder, where all the people I want are people with money that want to make money and people that need money to make money. Lo and behold, two years ago, I set out and I created Private Money Club. It's right there. Private Money Club is the first dating site for money. It is literally a community, a membership community where there are people with money and people that need money that come together and then they go out and they make babies. Those babies are not the babies you're thinking of. They're the interest, dividends, and profits. And on Private Money Club, I lend all of my money, and I lend it at a rate of 12% right now. I actually have one that's a little bit higher, but all I did is I take money from my policies and I lend it in Private Money Club. Then I take the interest that they pay me and I put it back in my bank, because if I had a bank that did all those things, why would I ever put money back in somebody else's bank? Folks, this is all I'm teaching you, is how to create a circle and how to have that circle come back to one place. That place is your bank instead of their bank. Thank you.